Turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. We're going to read from uh, chapter 6. Our text is 617b separate. And then we're going to turn over, we're going to flip over to 1 John chapter 2 and look at uh, verses 16 and following. Let me read uh, 2 Corinthians first. Our topic, this is our third sermon on what separation from the world involves. And um, today we're going to wrap things up, but we're going to get into application. We're going to get into the, uh, what separation is, how to have separation. Last week we looked at other issues. So let me read. I'm going to begin reading verse 14. Be ye not equally unyoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath, unright hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Righteousness. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath an unbeliever with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And then 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now thus far we've looked at a number of issues related to the biblical commands not to love the world, and to separate ourselves from the world. We saw the importance of this teaching. The majority of people who profess Christ at one time or another end up forsaking the faith for the pleasures and interests of this world. It's a sad but tragic fact. Over 70% of young people raised in evangelical homes reject Christ totally by the time they graduate from college. Those numbers are absolutely shocking. We saw John's inspired motivations for separation. Those who follow Christ abide in joy, bliss, and love forever. But those who follow the world are passing away. They will end up in the lake of fire, the ash heap of history. And we looked at a number of things that separation from the world are not. <clears throat> there are many professing Christians who have zeal without knowledge. If we do not divine separation biblically, that our efforts will all be in vain. We must do, we must think according to Scripture, believe according to Scripture, and act according to Scripture. And we also looked at some of the ways that John defined being in love with the world or being part of this evil world system. This morning and this afternoon, we will turn our attention to the biblical meaning of separation and application. How can we be separate from the world according to the general principles of Scripture? It's a broad topic. It involves sanctification. And there are a number of teachings in Scripture that can be applied to our topic. First, if we are to come out of the world and be separate, we must habitually, constantly, and consistently reject the world's view of reality and the world's view of what is right and wrong, and instead be guided by the standard of the sacred scriptures. It's quite obvious, but it's very important. This is the main overarching principle of separation that is above all others. If we look at world history, we will see 
that unregenerate mankind follows a common opinion, a common way of thinking, a common way of looking at reality, a common way of looking at ethics in society. <clears throat> Unsafe people go with the flow. They follow changing and evolving fashions and viewpoints, opinions, philosophies, and ethics. The American, for example, who lived in 1945 when World War II ended, would be absolutely baffled and confounded by society today. The idea that homosexuality would be acceptable and there would even be homosexual marriage would make people in 1945 faint. Even unbelievers in America. But it is perfectly acceptable today. <clears throat> they follow the world spirit or what the Germans call the Zitgeist. The true Christian rejects the world spirit, the world Zitgeist, and he will never be content with following the surrounding pagan culture. Instead, he will look to the Word of God. He will maintain that our world and life view must be derived from the sacred scriptures. Our view of ethics are right and wrong cannot change as society changes, but must remain constant. We believe in ethical absolutes. The Ten Commandments are non-negotiable. The moral standards of Scripture are non-negotiable. They're based on the nature of character of God and have God's authority behind them, and all mankind will be judged in the Day of Judgment by this standard. So it doesn't matter if 99% of our society says that homosexuality is a wonderful behavior and we should allow homosexuals to get married and have gay parades and so forth and gay pride month and all these kind of stuff. We emphatically reject that because it's unscriptural. Our view must be anchored to the word of God and therefore no matter what the people say or Hollywood or the civil government or the Supreme Court or the universities, the Christian remains firm. As society shifts, as society moves in a certain direction, we do not move. If you talk to a Christian in the second century, or the 15th century, or the 20th century, they should all be the same. The true Christian is dogmatic and will strongly maintain that nothing can be right, which God says is wrong. Nothing can be right that God says is wrong. And it makes me, it's very distressing to see how Christians deal with modern cultural issues because they believe in pluralism. They don't appeal to the Bible. And they should. They should flat out say, God says that homosexuality is wrong, it's immoral, it's a sin, it's an abomination, therefore it is. Because God says it. In the late 1980s, <clears throat> PBS <coughs> did a <coughs> documentary on theonomy or Christian Reconstruction. It's hard to believe what they did. And they interviewed Rush Duty and they, Bill Moyer, who's a uh, worked for Lyndon, B Lyndon Baines Johnson as a leftist and a complete and utter um, worldly uh, idiot, kept pressing Rush Duty on death penalty for this and this and that. And Rush Duty kept emphasizing, look, these are not my opinions. This is not what I think. This is what God has said. That settles the issue. And that's the way Christians should talk. It doesn't matter what you may think or what I may think. God has spoken. Thus saith the Lord, this is right, this is wrong. If 90% of the people believe homosexuality and sodomite or lesbian marriage is good and should be lawful, the Christian does not budge from his position one iota. And evangelicals, especially young people today, are budging. They're being influenced by the culture. If the culture accepts feminism, socialism, welfare statism, premarital sex, racism, chattel slavery, macroevolution, immodest dress, etc., the Christian says, I reject such thinking and behavior because it is contrary to the word of God. God has spoken, thus saith the Lord. 
Christians must remain separate from the world by first conforming their own mind to the mind of Christ, which of course always conforms to what the Bible says. When Jesus said, disciple the nations by commanding them, uh, by teaching them all things that I have commanded, that includes the whole Bible. Thus we see that doctrine and the knowledge of the Bible is crucial if we are to remain outside of the world. There's a reason your parents tell you to read your Bible every day. There's a reason that Reformed churches teach people to have a private time or private devotions, whatever you want to call it, where you sit down and you pray and you read three chapters of the Bible every day or more and meditate on it and think about it because you want to saturate your mind with the Word of God. It is a matter of what is to be our standard for living. Our choice is between basically some form of human autonomy, which is what the world teaches. Everything the world does is based on human autonomy and it has many expressions. Or we are to remain faithful to sola scriptura the Bible is our sole standard for faith and life, for doctrine and ethics. Sola Scriptura. And that's why the Roman Catholic Church is so worldly and so in tune with this world because they deny Sola Scriptura. To see the importance of this, consider what happened to the mainline denominations of the first half of the 20th century. Churchmen from the late 1800s onward began to be, buy into this uh, idea, <coughs> this mythology of modern science. Macroevolution, an earth billions of years old, and so forth. They bought into modern science because they believed in empiricism and they believed in the reliability of autonomous man making decisions and rulings based on human autonomy instead of the Word of God. And so they bought into the mythology of modern science, which is not good science. It is bad science. And they began to question the reliability of the Word of God. Seminaries abandoned the doctrine of the plenary inspiration of the Bible, of the Word of God, that is the very words are inspired, not simply thoughts or this or that, but the very words of the Bible are inspired. And they began to teach that the Bible had many historical, scientific, chronological, and even ethical mistakes. And I saw a debate on Nightline many, many years ago. It was a debate between a conservative PCUSA pastor, a quote conservative, quotation marks around the word conservative, and a liberal minister over women's ordination or something to that effect, or gay marriage, I forget what it was. But they both presuppose that the Bible had mistakes in it and the Bible had mistakes as to ethics. And both acknowledge that Paul was a sexist. That is totally satanic. They adopted the position and or the worldview of the surrounding pagan culture. <clears throat> That's what they did. <clears throat> they did not judge the science, ethics, sociology and surrounding culture by the Bible, which is what you're supposed to do, but they judged the Bible by the surrounding pagan culture. They turned reality upside down. They adopted a humanistic worldview instead of the Bible, and they were absorbed into the evil world system. The result is that the mainline churches have lost the truth and have become the world. They are the world. Yes, they have religious terminology. They wear clericals and they have crosses on and they have church buildings and they have communion and they talk very churchy and they have sermons that are churchy, but it has nothing to do with the Bible or the word of God. It's secular humanism masquerading as Christianity. Once the anchor or foundation of truth is compromised, the whole body will eventually succumb to the world's zitgeist. You will become the world if you cast aside the word of God in any way. And so-called neo-evangelicals, Fuller Seminary, and these scholars that are denying 
the six days of creation that are denying the flood, the universal flood, that are denying uh, creationism for a form of theistic evolution and so forth. They're simply repeating the pattern that took place in the late 1800s and early 20th century. They're becoming the world. On politics, economics, ethics, abortion, homosexuality, feminism, and virtually every topic, the mainline churches are no different than the world. The World Council of Churches in the 1970s gave money to Marxist guerrillas in Africa that were murdering and persecuting Christians. So that tells you what they are. They are anti-Christian and satanic to the core. They rejected the Bible because of a faith in mankind and autonomous human reason, autonomous science, and have lost Christ, they've lost the truth, they've lost the Bible, they've lost heaven. They've lost it all because of their defective, unbiblical view of the Word of God. And they will be cast into the lake of fire with the secular humanists, the feminists, the sodomites, and the socialists, and the Marxists. And they deservedly, they are more evil in a sense than a flat out atheistic communist because they pretend to be Christians. They're antichrists. They pretend to be Christians when they're not. And by the way, every one of these denominations is a big supporter of the Democratic Party. Anybody who supports the Democratic Party or votes for a Democrat should be excommunicated. And I mean that, because the Bible teaches that. You're voting for a party that's essentially atheistic, pro-sodomite, pro-abortion, pro-murder, that ethically is, is in the same sphere as the Nazis of Germany. We see that true belief in the Bible or the infallible word of God is necessary to combat worldliness. <clears throat> Embracing the world is an external symptom of unbelief. Remember Hebrews chapter 11, we'll bring it up again later, but remember Hebrews chapter 11, the, the, the hall of faith, this, these great men and women of faith, what do they all have in common? A firm, strong, abiding trust in the word of God. No matter what the circumstances of life, no matter how, thing bad, how bad things got, no matter how much they were persecuted, no matter how bad things got for them, their faith in the word of God was not shaken and they persevered. They did not go back to the world. Evangelicals have not been immune of worldliness because of the adoption of dispensationalism. has removed the whole Old Testament law as a moral standard for the Christian. Satan has different tactics for removing the word of God from the life of professing Christians. That's while a fundamentalist may not drink a beer, which by the way is perfectly lawful and actually is healthy and good for you. I said one beer, I didn't say a six pack. He will gladly and habitually break the Sabbath. The standard of ethical separation from the world is the whole moral law of God is taught in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. <clears throat> Without the standard, professing Christians are adrift on a sea of worldly antinomianism where the evangelicals pick up fads. And these fads are all of the world. They're not from God. The abolition movement of slavery, while American slavery was certainly unscriptural and certainly unbiblical and should have been abolished, the abolition movement was a, was a pagan movement that Christians should not have participated in. They should have had their own movement, a biblical movement. The temperance movement, the idea that we have to get rid of all alcoholic beverages and that all alcoholic beverages are terrible and sinful. That is of the world. That was a world movement, not a Christian movement. And all it did was it caused, in the old days, only men went to bars to hang out and have a beer with their friends and smoke a cigar. Uh, 
men and women went to bars after the 1920s, and they went there, and it became places uh, where fornication was engendered. And of course, they basically made the mafia about a thousand times stronger than it used to be. Because good intentions are not what makes society better. Human opinion is not what makes society better. The Word of God makes society be better. And when you depart from the Word of God, you have unintended consequences. And the teetotaler movement, while supported by many different Christian groups, spread evil throughout the United States and did great harm. Evangelicals would be aghast if they saw a child smoking a cigarette. Yet they send them to state schools to be indoctrinated by state-certified disciples of Satan. Over 95% of evangelicals send their kids to the state schools to be taught feminism, pro-homosexuality, evolution, arbitrary relativistic ethics, socialism, statism, you name it. Then when they apostatize, they wonder why. Do they expect a 35-minute mediocre sermon to counteract 30 hours a week of satanic indoctrination? And not only are they satanically indoctrinated in these state schools, they're surrounded by a bunch of pagans who are interested in being cool and worldly and acting like total fools. If we are to avoid the world, we must saturate our minds with the truth of Scripture. Because the best defense is a good offense. And you see throughout history, whenever the church, whenever professing Christians have got away from the Word of God and its teaching, they always act like complete fools. And they always embrace something of this world. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, the people perish. Without the word of God, the people will perish. Without biblical direction, we will stumble and we will fall and we will embrace worldly philosophies, masquerading as Christian philosophies. And then second, if we are not to be swallowed by the world, then we must daily and habitually put into practice biblical principles of sanctification. This means that on a daily basis, we must work to replace unbiblical thoughts and actions, unbiblical ways of thinking, unbiblical ways of speaking, unbiblical ways of behaving with positive biblical counterparts. For example, if someone, for example, is being tempted by arguments for macroevolution, then what do they need to do? Well, then you need to go to people like Ken Ham and good arguments on creationism and these are excellent arguments, and they're truly scientific. They're truly based on um, looking at the Word of God and looking at uh, repeatable, observable things instead of conjecture and following a paradigm that completely does not fit with reality, which is macroevolution. You, you replace your bad thinking with good thinking from the Word of God. Study excellent books on creationism. If someone is having a problem with spending and being materialistic. Oh, I've got to have that TV. I've got to have that gaming system. I've got to have that fancy stereo. So I'm going to get a credit card and I'm going to go into debt, which the Bible condemns. Oh, no man, anything. I'm going to go into debt so I can have things that I really can't afford. I knew a Christian family that had $160,000 of debt due to spending money on crap. And what's shocking about the whole thing is, is you look at their house and you look at their possessions and like, where did all this money go? If that's your problem, you need to study passages on covetousness and responsible spending. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, but you should save up and pay for them. And they should not be a priority. 
Instead of going to the mall to waste money on things you do not really need, you could help poor, truly needy Christians. If a person is tempted by lascivious images, pornography, fornication, and adultery, that person needs to focus their desires on a Christian spouse. Paul says, if you burn, get married. And then he goes on. The assumption is there is an outlet for sexual desire, and that's your wife or your husband. And the wife and the husband must cooperate and make sure that things are taken care of so there is no temptation. If one studies Paul and how to deal with sin and temptation, one will see that Paul does not simply condemn certain behaviors. He also advocates lawful productive counterparts. He understood that you cannot find something with nothing. And there are a number of examples, and Jay Adams calls this the put-off, put-on principle. It could, you could call it true replacement therapy. You're getting rid of this unbiblical thinking, this unbiblical behavior, this unbiblical way of speaking, and replacing it with godly counterparts. Here's just a few passages. Galatians 5, 13 to 26. This is what Paul says. This is an early epistle, and this is his section on sanctification. For you, brethren, have, not been, called to have been called to liberty. <clears throat> Only do not use liberty for an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Okay, so he says, don't serve the flesh, and then he presents an alternative. Through love, serve one another. For, he bases his teaching on God's law, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul says, look, if you don't want to walk in the flesh, or according to the flesh, then you must be led by the Spirit of God. You must be led by the Holy Spirit. Instead of fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, you must walk according to the Spirit, behave according to the Spirit, act according to the Spirit. When the Apostle is speaking about walking according to the Holy Spirit, he does not mean that you hear a still, small voice in your head or you get mystical impressions. This has nothing to do with the charismatic way of thinking. Oh, I, I think I'm being led to do this. No, the, the, the biblical way of thinking is as you study the Bible and the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to you and bends your heart and enables you to obey the Bible. He's discussing the Bible, the Word of God, and especially the Old Testament moral law and its New Testament application. The Bible identifies behaviors that are immoral and displeasing to God and tells us what kind of behaviors are good. Therefore, we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil when we study the Bible, assess our thoughts, words, and deeds in terms of the Bible, and then replace unbiblical behaviors with godly counterparts. This central principle of sanctification is called the put-off, put-on dynamic. In Ephesians, Paul is even more explicit. After speaking of the futile manner in which unbelievers think and uh, behave, and he talks about how they're getting worse and worse and worse, in their ignorance, in their darkness. He says this, 
<clears throat> this is from 420 to 32. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may be, give something, have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. For Paul, Sanctification is always a two-part process. There is a dying to sin, a mortification of the flesh, a putting off the old man as one takes off a garment that's filthy and smelly and vile, and then a living to righteousness or putting on the new man, the man who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, believes in Jesus Christ and bows to the mediator as Lord and makes a diligent effort to continually put off the works of darkness. In verse 24, we are told that we must orient our thinking, speech, and behavior according to our new life in true righteousness and holiness. This is a, a reference to our transformation due to our union with Christ in his sacrificial death and victorious resurrection. And Paul goes on in much more detail about this in Romans chapter 6 and 7. After this great lengthy exposition of justification by faith alone, Paul deals with the obvious objection of the Judaizers and the Jews. Well, if you're forgiven by Jesus Christ, if you're justified by Jesus Christ, and he fulfills the law in your place, and he dies on the cross and removes all the guilt and penalty of sin, and you get to go to heaven solely because of the work of Jesus Christ, solely because of the merits of Jesus Christ, solely because of his redemptive work, then people are going to go out and sin as they please. They're going to go out and have a good time. They're going to go out and sin because Christ has done it all. And so in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. God forbid because you've been united with him in his death and resurrection, you've died to sin. The old man has been put to death definitively. And you've risen with him, and you're given new life. You're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The old man has been put to death in a sense, and you've, you're a new man now. And you must live and act according to the new principle, the new man, your regenerated heart. And therefore you will obey the law of God, not to be saved, not to earn redemption, not to merit anything, but out of gratitude for your redemption, out of your love for God, out of your desire to please Him, out of the fact that He is your Lord and now you have to obey Him. The ability to put off the old ways and put on the new is rooted solely in the redemptive work of Christ. Thus, always remember this. Jesus Christ and his redemptive work is the foundation of our sanctification. <clears throat> Thus it is appropriate to speak of Christ as the foundation or source of our new life and sanctification. While the law of God is the standard of sanctification. When Paul condemns the law of God in the epistles, He's talking about the Jewish attempt to be justified by the law of God. For if you read his sections on sanctification, he turns right around and he starts applying the Ten Commandments to Christian behavior. Paul's not explicitly self-contradictory. Paul's not irrational. 
When Paul speaks of not being under the law, or the law is a dead letter, he is speaking of a pharisaical Jewish attempts at being righteous and earning redemption without Christ and of attempting to be holy without the Holy Spirit that the victorious Savior imparts to the elect from heaven. You see, it's Jesus through his redemptive work that enables you to turn from the world because he gives you a new heart that has new priorities, new loves, a, a, a completely different perspective. Thus, when we speak of fighting the world through the put-off, put-on dynamic, we understand that this requires strong faith in Christ and his work and continued prayer and reliance on Christ who is at the right hand of God even now, interceding on our behalf. <clears throat> then after speaking of the source or foundation of sanctification, Paul gives specific examples of how sanctification should work. The person who has a tendency to lie. I mean, every one of us have met people like that. They have, a, they have a tendency to lie. People like that, they lie. They don't even need to lie. They just like to lie. They've got a habit of lying must learn to speak the truth in love for we are members of one another. For Paul, the idea of Christians deceiving each other is completely absurd. Would your hand lie to the foot? Would your eye lie to your ear? Would your nose lie to your kneecap? It, it, the idea of Christians lying to each other and mistreating each other for Paul is completely foreign. Instead of deceiving people, which is a characteristic of Satan, Christians are to speak the truth unto edification for the good of the other believer. For the good of the other believer. If a believer gets angry, he must not let the anger become an occasion for sinful behavior, but must control it and achieve reconciliation with the offending Christian before bedtime. The offended Christian before bedtime. Instead of anger being the occasion for plotting revenge, which is the world's way of doing things, it becomes the occasion for reconciliation and forgiveness. If someone was a thief, he must replace that behavior with hard labor, lawful labor, so that he would be able to help other Christians in need. You meet people, they're lazy. Nowadays, it's acceptable to leech off people through state welfare programs. That's theft. The state's your thief. The state puts a gun to people's heads and says, give me your taxes so I can give it to people in the ghetto who like to watch uh, soap operas and smoke crack and have babies out of wedlock and fornicate. The state becomes the thief. But you're still a thief if you take that money. No, Paul says, no, work hard. Get a good job. Do lawful labor so you can help Christians out. The person who is into corrupt speech, and the speech that is putrid, filthy, foul, offensive, and injurious, must replace that behavior with speech that edifies, that helps others, that builds them up. We see that Christian separation from the world is a very practical, active, daily aspect of a believer's walk. And then third, And these are all interrelated. A Christian who desires to come out from the world and to be separate must be careful who he hangs out with or how he spends his leisure time. Christians, especially young professing Christians, who choose friends who are very lax Christians at best or who decide to hang out with the heathen, place themselves in incredible danger. Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. This is a very general exhortation, by the way, that must not be limited to intermarriage with unbelievers. That's how it's used, but it's broader than that. You don't want to start a business with an unbeliever. You don't want to join a fraternal club with unbelievers, like the Masons who were pagans. Freemasonry is paganry. You don't want to be involved with unbelievers on that level. The Corinthian Christians lived in the San Francisco of the Roman Empire. The people were obsessed with sexual debauchery, drunkenness, and idolatry. 
Thus the apostle warns them against entangling and dangerous associations. Jesus mingled with prostitutes and tax collectors in order to tell them to repent and believe the gospel. Therefore, Paul is not advocating refusing to speak to unbelievers and being courteous and so on. He's not saying to go out of the world. He's not saying to have, have no interaction with the unbelievers. He's saying don't have these entangling associations with them. You'd be crazy to start a business with an unbeliever or to join a club of unbelievers. And especially to marry an unbeliever or even consider marrying an unbeliever is insanity. So Paul's not advocating refusing to speak to unbelievers and so forth, but there's a big difference between being a Christian, meeting with pagans to tell them about Christ and hanging out with them to listen to filthy jokes, smoke pot, get drunk or behave and act like a pagan. <clears throat> if you're in college and you're with unbelievers and you witness to them and you tell them about Christ and you act as a Christian, they're gonna either become Christians or they're gonna tell you to hit the road. But if you hang out with them and you're not witnessing to them, then you're descending to their level. And you become, you act like a pagan to fit in with the pagans. And then, therefore, you merge right back into the world. The Christian college student that acts like a Christian will not have pagan friends for long. For they're going to either convert to Christ or rebel against the gospel. Wicked companions have been the downfall of many Christians, especially young professing Christians. Parties are said to be in communion when they are so united with what belongs to the one belongs to the other. Or what is true of the one is true of the other. Believers are in communion or a fellowship one with another. When they recognize each other as having a joint interest in the benefits of redemption, and are conscious that the inward experience of the one is that of the other. We have that in common. We may not have the same hobbies or the same interests as far as somebody might like to hunt, somebody might like to grow flowers. But our worldview and our interest in Christ join us together in one body. Pagans are in communion with each other because they are interested in the same vices and the same bad habits and the same sinful activities. Some of the hobbies are not necessarily sinful. They may like to go to baseball games or so forth. But they are in league with each other on a worldly level. Potheads love to hang out with potheads. Fornicators hang out with fornicators. Drug addicts like to hang out with drug addicts. Drunkard, drunkards like to hang out with drunkards and so on. It is obvious that it would be dangerous to spend leisure time with such people. It would be foolish. It would be insane. Yet Christian evangelicals go off to college and they hang out with unbelievers and they start fornicating and getting stoned and getting drunk and they end up leaving the church altogether. Human nature is so constituted that we cannot uh, be around other people a lot without having it affect us in our own character. And that old proverb must be in our mind constantly because it's true. Tell me with whom a man chooses to live or hang out with, and I will tell you what he is. You can judge a person by who he spends his time with. Proverbs 13, 20, the Bible says, He that walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits or the New American Standard Bible, good morals. <clears throat> if you hang out with evil people, if you hang out with people who sit around and gossip and backbite, if you hang out with thieves or potheads, it's going to have a negative effect on you and it's going to draw you into the world. If you choose as a friend someone who does not care about his own soul or the Bible or God or Christ or holiness or who regards the things of the true religion as of secondary importance, then you will not progress in holiness and will soon slide back toward the world. 
once again, if you're acting as a Christian among these people, they're going to they're either going to become Christians or they're going to tell you to get lost. Because people who are involved in sin and in love with sin and wallowing in the mire don't like somebody to show up with a bucket of soap and water and say, hey, it's time to believe in Christ. It's time to repent of your sins. It's time to obey the law of God. They don't want to hear that. A serious Christian will not keep company with, as it says in the book of Acts, lewd fellows of the baser sort. It's unwise. It's unbiblical. It's suicidal spiritually to do it. Don't do it. In addition, we must be careful how we spend our leisure time. We must be careful where we go and what we watch and what we do. If we would love our souls and would not become worldly, then we must not read the immoral garbage produced by the fashion industry or watch the immoral trash produced by Hollywood. sitcoms and almost everything produced by network TV other than perhaps documentaries and even they have a liberal slant is complete garbage. It's complete garbage based on filthy jokes and immoral behavior. We don't need to read fashion magazines or gossip mills or the entertainment rags. We must not be lazy or neglectful of personal Bible reading, prayer, or public worship. To not habitually attend on the means of grace is to become lukewarm and to drift back toward the world. So watch how you spend your leisure time. Certainly there's nothing wrong with having fun. There's lots of lawful activities that are fun. My wife likes to garden. I love fish ponds. Okay, there's lots of things to do. Ole loves to hunt when he has time. But don't be hanging out with pagans. It's suicide. And then fourth, in order to be separate from the world and avoid apostasy, we must steadily and habitually make sure that we do not allow ourselves to be swallowed up and absorbed in the business of the world. Let me explain. A true Christian will strive to do his duty and be the best he can be at his calling in life, whether he's a plumber or a merchant or a nurse uh, or a banker, or a doctor, lawyer, farmer, whatever. These lawful callings, these good callings, whatever you do, you do it under the Lord. He is to do his work as under the Lord and not under men. He's to do his work heartily, faithfully as a Christian. He is to apply Christian principles to his calling and thus contribute. Uh, to our duty to fulfill the dominion mandate and develop a Christian culture, a Christian society, Christian agriculture, Christian business, Christian farming. Now, having noted all this, we must be on guard that our job does not intrude upon our spiritual duties or cause us to, play Christ, to place Christ and his church on the, on the back burner, so to speak. There are professing Christians who allow non-emergency business activities to take away their Sundays, their Sabbaths. They work and they should not work. And when they are in church, they are meditating on their business. They're obsessed with it. You see, there are things that are lawful that can become a snare and a danger when they are overemphasized and become idols. This is true of hobbies as well. If somebody is obsessed with something that's lawful, it can become idolatry. This is a particular danger in cultures where success and riches are treated as the great goals in life. The be-all, end-all of living. Success, wealth, fancy cars, bigger houses, mansions, rich and famous. It is far better to be less rich and less prosperous if our riches and businesses are intruding upon our spiritual lives. You don't need that great vacation every year if, it, if you're working hard and not doing your spiritual duties. You don't need to buy that new car every three years if it's interfering with your spiritual duties. Americans are exceptionally materialistic. Our society, for all intents and purposes, completely repudia, has repudiated the Sabbath. It is seen as foolish and bad business to keep a store closed on Sunday. 
There used to be blue laws or Sabbatarian laws all over our country. They're gone. I think the last place was in western Michigan and they finally succumbed. And of course, the politicians were putting pressure on the business. You know, they wanted more money. They make money in idle. But this pagan attitude must be fought against tooth and nail if we are to be separate from this world. Evangelical churches following the anti-Christian papal church have been begun conducting, it's very popular, especially in California, they've been conducting Saturday evening services so people don't have to come to church on Sunday, the Lord's Day. They're doing this not so they can have additional services, have one on Saturday night and come back on Sunday. They're doing it so people can have Sunday free to engage in their fun activities. Go to the beach, go water skiing or snow skiing, go scuba diving, go to the NFL football game or a baseball game. They're doing it so they don't have to come to church on Sunday. They want to free their Sundays up to do things that are not lawful on the Sabbath. And this is worldliness. It is compromise. It is a sign of apostasy. Matthew Henry, in his works, it's not in his commentary, it's in a sermon on the Sabbath. He says, if you want to judge where a culture is, is as far as Christ, the relationship to Christ and God, if you want to look at a culture, I'm paraphrasing obviously, he says, look at how they treat the Sabbath. If they disregard the Sabbath, then you know you have a, a wicked apostate culture. And evangelicals, in fact, I have a book downstairs called Sabbath, the Lord's Day, written by, it's a big fat, big fat book written by the faculty of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is the premier evangelical seminary in the United States. And the whole thesis of the book is that God has gotten rid of the Sabbath. We don't have a Sabbath anymore. That's the whole thesis of the book. Now we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. I have a, a number, some more points, and then we have a bunch of application. This is not rocket science. This is not difficult. These are simple doctrines. This is an aspect of your Christian sanctification. This is something that you need to focus on every day. We saw last week the dangers of, of falling back into the world. In the, in the 1970s, in the, in, the late 70s, I was a Pentecostal street preacher. <clears throat> and I used to witness to my friends. And I can tell you that I, there were like at, at least 35 people that I personally, quote, brought to Christ, unquote. And I kept tabs on those people because I knew these were people I knew. Out of those 35 people, two, two. And these are people that made a profession of faith, that went out and bought Christian books in the Bible. They started going to church every week. Out of those 35 people, only two today, well, one has passed away from cancer, but only two today remain professing Christians. Out of 35, you have to see the danger of going back to the world. You have to see the danger of going back to the world. So we'll take a little break. We'll come back. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us these loving warnings out of your word given to your holy apostles by the Holy Spirit for our benefit, because you love us. You care about us. You want us to be faithful. We ask, Lord, that you would ingrain these truths into our minds and our hearts, that we would be obedient to your word, and that we would be diligent, and that you would sanctify us <coughs> as you promised, based on the efficacy of the death and resurrection of your dear son, Jesus Christ. We know that we have victory in him. We know that Christ is our sanctification. We know that you will not allow us to fall away. But we also know, Lord, that you, in sanctification, it, we are responsible to act. So strengthen our faith in your word that we will act and be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.